everybody. It's Pastor Allen here. I'm so glad we were able to get together, even if only by the internet. I uh, just wanted to say that I love you. April and I are praying for you through this time. And I know this is inconvenient. This is not normal. It's not how we would do things. But the Bible says where two or three are gathered together, he's in the midst. So thank God that we can worship. And the government is not trying to stop us from getting the gospel out. We're just trying to be in compliance and be safe. So don't let that get into your head either. Today we get to enjoy a message from the past. We didn't... Uh, we weren't able to complete a full live stream option, but we are able to play something that I think will minister to you. I think it's a good moment for us to go back and just remember some of the things that God has taught us. So take the time over the next little while and just enjoy this message. Gather the family around the table or the computer or TV, whatever it is that you're doing to watch this. And we get to all watch it together and go forward. And here we are. Let's go into this message and watch Destiny and the Dumb Thing. 
Everybody wants to hear me today. All right. Uh, First Kings. Let's go to First Kings uh, chapter 19, please, if you don't mind. And Cameron, you can turn those house lights on if you'd like. Well, never mind. Never mind. Do it however you normally do it. I'm, I'm a little, I'm backward on everything. So, <clears throat> First Kings chapter 19. We're going to start at verse 15. We're going to go a little Old Testament today, which is something a little out of the norm for me. But the Lord woke me up this morning and told me to talk about a few things. Now, I've preached this message in the past, and, uh, but it's not something that I've, I've dealt with in the last few years. But he started talking to me about it last night. So we're going to obey him. That's the most important thing, right? Uh, you know, I, trust me, I'm a fan of, of series, and I'm a fan of timing. And I'm a fan of all that. But if you, if you time the Holy Spirit right out of your service, you've messed up. So we want to start out right. Verse 15. And the Lord said of him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou hast comest, uh, anoint uh, Hazael to be the king over Syria. Uh, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, thou shalt uh, anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel, uh, anoint to be prophet in thy room, or, or to take his place. And it shall come to pass, verse 17... Uh, that him uh, that escaped the sword of Hazael, he, he tried to accomplish these things, and uh, Jehu slay, and him that escapes from the sword, Jehu shall slay, uh, shall Elisha slay. He's, he's prophesying the things that will take place. Now, verse 18 says, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel. All that he's, he's basically saying, I've got people. Some of y'all need to know that in your life. You don't need, all you need is somebody to like you. You don't need everybody to. All the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, every mouth which not kissed, uh, uh, to which him he has not kissed him. So he departed thence, and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing, say plowing, with tw- he was working, right? Let me stop right there. I got a whole other message. Let's just stop right here. He went to find the person that would replace him, his next call into the ministry. But he found him doing what? Plowing. Now, there are some of us in here that are so spiritual I don't know who you are, and I'm not going to embarrass you, but you need to listen to me. All this, I'm going to go home and pray for, for 12 months out of a year, and I ain't going to go take care of my family. I'm just going to wait on God, and I'm not going to, you know, God will call me. God will give me what I need. The, a prophet was found working. I know you're not excited about that. But this whole mindset that we're just going to believe God for everything and not put any human effort in is false. God requires from us things. Now, when the Bible says, now this ain't my message, this is for free, okay? When the Bible says that, that he who doesn't work doesn't eat, that, that is talking about taking care of your family. But it's also talking about being diligent enough to find the work he's called you to. It's when you find the path of the work that you're called to that God can pour out the blessing. But Elisha obviously didn't know the path he was called to. He was busy working because he wasn't sure. So, now let me explain something to you. He was working, the Bible says, it goes on to say, he was, he was the 12th yoke. Now understand that, when you're the 12th yoke, it means you own all 12 of them. The other 11 work for you. So not only was he working, he owned his own business. And so he's dealing with his business, he's dealing with his family, it was a family-owned business. And a prophet came into his life walked through his rows, walked right up to him. There was, a, there was 12 people out there working, walked right up to him and threw his mantle on him, which is which signified, you're going to follow me. I mean, think about it. You're, you're going to come follow me. Which meant, he knew what that meant. That, yeah, we got this, now, I don't know how many of y'all in here have ever had any real experience behind the scenes of ministry, but especially nowadays, even ministers have an entitlement mentality that if they can speak halfway good, that they're just supposed to be given something. They don't serve. They don't learn. And that's why the heartbeat of the church is not right sometimes. It's because we have leaders who expect things from people that they wouldn't do themselves. Now, that's just my own personal axe to grind. We shall move forward. Um, so Elijah, Elijah throws his mantle onto Elisha. And he says, basically, with that move, you have an opportunity to come with me. But Elisha had to accept what that meant. And that meant, yes, in the long run, I'm going, to, I'm going to take his place. I'm going to be in the school of the prophets. I'm going to be in the brotherhood. The king's going to call me to prophesy. The king's going to use me as God's voice in this kingdom. But what it meant up until then was while Elijah was praying or interceding or talking to the kings or doing whatever it is he needs to do, the travel mindset was that Elisha would now take up the slack, which means he goes gets the water, he makes the coffee, he washes the car. He waxes the shoes. He does all that stuff. He now becomes a servant, yet he's promised the office of prophet. And he says this to Elijah. Now, you can go read all this. I don't want to bore you with all these scriptures, but it's right here where you're at. 
he says to Elijah. He chases him down. And he says, why, why, why did you do this to me? And Elijah, Elijah says to Elisha, I have nothing to do with thee. Wasn't saying that I don't want you. He was saying this is God's business. That's what he was saying. So Elisha said, let me go tell my mother and father goodbye. Let me go tell my family. Let me go kiss them. And I'm, I'll be here. And, and again, Elijah, was, he said, this is God's business. This ain't mine. And he kept on going. He left him there. So not only did Elisha go and kiss his mother and father and tell him he was done. Now listen, read this story. The Bible says that he took an axe. Now the other 11 guys are still working. So they're watching this happen. That he takes an axe and absolutely destroys his plow and the ox that was pulling it. Now imagine the gruesome sight. I mean, this is just, this is real stuff. This ain't Hollywood. He has taken an axe, completely torn apart an animal. To say, I am making my mind solely up that this is where I'll be for the rest of my life. I will step into the grace, into the gift, and the call on my life and become what God's called me to become. Because now I have nothing. I have destroyed the very thing that I thought I could come back to. Because what happened was this very simple thing. And, and if you don't get anything from anything I say today, get this. Elijah was a man who was struggling with who he was. We've all been there. Amen. How many times have you asked the question, why am I even here? What am I here to do? What's, what's the point? Elijah is sitting here. He runs a business. He's successful. He's taking care of his community. He's agricultural. He understands how the land works. The man ran the show. He had money in the bank. His family was well off. He was walking away from everything. But yet he was still wrestling on the inside of himself because there is something to be said about what you put your eyes on every day. And what do you think he saw every day? Sitting on a plow behind an ox. Y'all think about that visual. This was his life. And other things. That's how he lived his life. And every day he knew there was more in him. Every day he knew there was more he could do. Every day he knew there was something in him that was drawing him. And he had a point. He, he had a, a choice to make. He came to a point where he had to make a choice. And the choice was between the, the ox and his destiny. And you've got to understand that something about an ox. The reason they had to be yoked is because they were considered dumb animals. They were strong. They could do just about anything. But people say sheep are dumb, and they are. Not you, perfect people. But sheep as an animal are not very smart. But the only thing dumber than a sheep is an ox. And it'll keep plowing until it goes right off the edge. It'll just keep walking until it just falls to its death. So he lived his life, listen to me now, he lived his life tethered and attached to something that drove him, but yet he had to drive it. He was tethered to something that did all the work for him, but he still had to do the work to lead it. He was tethered to something that was dumb. How many times have you looked at your life and realized that it's the same dumb thing that keeps coming up in your life that you keep finding yourself at, that same dumb person you keep connecting to, those same dumb images you keep looking at, those same dumb thoughts that you keep believing, those same dumb people in your life that keep telling you who you're not, and you're missing an opportunity to cut it away and destroy it and be around the people who look at you and tell you absolutely who you are, but you choose the dumb thing over your destiny and when you can look at life in such a way that you make a choice to absolutely destroy everything that would hold you back now you can become everything you're called to be because you're not tethered to the dumb thing anymore now we're not going to talk about people's dumb things today because uh, uh, you know that's an ugly list you know for some people for, for some people the dumb thing is pornography for other people the dumb thing is just being mean and ugly to your spouse for some people, the thing that's holding them back is the fact that they can't keep a good attitude for three days in a row. For some people, the dumb thing is just that they, they, they think that they're haughty or they're arrogant. They're better than everybody else. Anybody know any of these people? Now, I know it's not any of y'all, but, but do you know any of these people? Because, listen, when I go in Walmart, I see people. You ever seen anybody smile at Walmart? Anybody? When I go to Walmart, I don't see that. When I go to Walmart, I see people tied to dumb things. And it's torn their life apart. They're sticking with things and they can't get past their own mind. Do you realize the only thing in this world that can defeat you? Listen, Satan can't even defeat you. He's a defeated foe. 
He just keeps talking to you. And he keeps reminding you of the dumb thing that's got you tied down. He keeps reminding you of your flaws. He keeps reminding... Let let me just pull the curtain back on ministry. Every single one of us have warts and scars. Every single one of us. And when you live your life in such a way that, that you present yourself as if you're perfect, now you've just eliminated your opportunity to speak to somebody. And not only that, you've put yourself in God's place. Because nobody needs you to save them. They need you to show them the Savior. Because when we live life trying to be God, See, y'all, I got 25 notes up here, ain't got to them, so just relax. When we try to be God, we put ourselves in his seat, two things happen. First of all, we put ourselves in a situation where now a target's on our back because we've made ourselves more. But secondly, and the most important thing, is you have now given a flawed image to people of who Jesus is. He's perfect. He loves you with a perfect love. He loves you in such a way that you can't even fathom how much he cares. You know, all the things that we call dumb things and that we're tied to and and that are keeping us from our destiny, all of those things that we don't talk about at church or at parties or at the house when we're playing uh, airsoft, whatever it is, all those things you don't want to bring up, he knows about and he still cares about you. All the things that you're unwilling to set into an office and counsel over. All the things that you're unwilling to bring up to your spouse. All the things that you're unwilling to talk to your family about. He knows. And he's not falling off the throne. And if you could just understand he loves you right there. And get a passion and a fire down on the inside of you. And get to a place where where you know that he's cast a mantle upon your life. And all he asks you to do. All he asks you to do is trust him. Just trust him. Just trust Him. Trust and faith. Let me explain something to you. Trust and faith are... are, are, A lot of people use those words interchangeably. Faith Faith is simple. Faith is simple because faith is very, very general. You know, you, you have faith when you're coming down 78 that somebody on the other side ain't going to fly over the, the median and hit you head on. That, that's faith. Because you have a general belief that people will drive right. Obviously, you've never been in Jasper. But truthfully, because nobody knows how to turn at, at the lights. And, and why not? TJ, why is the problem? So, it, it's just a personal thing. But, but faith is general. Trust is intimate. Y'all listen now. Trust takes something out of you and puts it in another person. I love April Bailey. She's, she's in the nursery today. And if there's any person in this room that I trust, it's her. It's because she knows all my warts and scars. She knows all my dumb things. She reminds me of them daily. And if I want her to know that, I will tell her. She, she loves me no matter where I'm at. She loves me no matter what I'm doing. She's not Jesus, but she's close. I think she was born snoring in tongues, I'll be honest with you. But, but here's the thing. We've built that intimate relationship over 25 years. 25 years of sharing who we are. Was it easy? No. <laughs> no. no. We, we, we got to a place at one point where, where we literally just had to say, we got to lay it all on the table or we got to go our separate ways. And thank God we, we got it. But trust is intimate. Trust is intertangled. So trust trust is, is married to the other person. Trust is covenant. Covenant isn't just an agreement. Covenant builds on your strengths and your weaknesses. That's how covenant works. Covenant works like this. Covenant works as if, as if I'm a farmer and I can grow vegetables and Caleb is a hunter and he can kill things. We make a covenant that your strength and my strength and your weaknesses and my weaknesses will be forever tangled together. So if I go through a season where the ground won't produce, he is now in covenant through relationship and intimacy and responsibility, bound by that trust to go kill something so I can eat. And if he can't find nothing and he goes through a bad season where there's nothing in the woods and, and he can't bring home that 12 point, then it's my job to take vegetable soup over there and say, this is, y- y'all are not going to starve. That's how it works. And y'all, I'm fixing to be real honest and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings and I don't think I will in here. But the church has gotten to a place where we don't understand covenant anymore. We don't, we don't understand that there's a covenant between a shepherd and sheep. We, we, we've made rock stars of people behind the pulpit. 
And we got all the lights. And we got it here. Hey, I love y'all. We got a great group, right? I love our praise team. I love how we do things. But when that becomes church and we miss the heartbeat of what he sent us here to do, then we're just another social club. All right, guys, I hope you're enjoying this so far, Destiny and the Dumb Thing. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is the father-son relationship between Elijah and Elisha and the dynamic there and all the things that went on. It's always amazing to me that when the right person comes into your life, your entire life begins to shift and all those, those things, they're uncomfortable. They're not always the most fun things to go through, but man, is it necessary. And when we see... Uh, Elisha's life begin to change in the right direction following the prophet the man walks into the double portion all the things that are going on in his life and the things we get to read about what an amazing thing just remember we're here you can you can always click on the chat button you can always send us a message you can always get with us I hope you enjoy the rest of this message destiny and the dumb thing and we'll see you soon See, when you don't see covenant, when you don't see that he's separated you from the dumb thing, when you don't see that he wants to be intimate and kind and close, when you don't see those things, you live in this isolated state of, of why am I this way? Publicly, I'm great. I'm a rock star on the road, but I'm a blunder in the house. Why is that? Well, there's some dumb things still there. And you haven't trusted the covenant enough. You haven't thrown yourself into the covenant enough for God to pull that stuff out of you. He already knows. So just let it go. I can tell by your enthusiasm. We're having a great time today. But it's true that the hardest thing to do is to pull a soul tie out of you, to pull something out of you that's tied to you. Now, trust, although, although it's very intimate, it's also peaceful. Now, now listen. Now, I know we, we, we're more of a teaching vein today, but listen. The reason trust is peaceful is because if you trust somebody, there should be peace and you shouldn't have to beg them and manipulate them into doing what they said they would do. You should just trust them to do it. And if they don't do it, they're violating that. You're not. See, <laughs> pastors, I'm fixed, like, like I said, I'm, I'm transparent about churches today. Pastors have spent most of their careers learning how to manipulate offerings to take care of the church rather than building the covenant where we're all in this thing together and, and, and seeing this thing grow together. Pastors have learned, not because, not because they're bad people, but, but because people don't understand these things anymore. Pastors have learned how to, how, you know, my pet peeve, y'all, I'm in the Word of Faith, and if my Word of Faith father saw this, they'll call me and fuss at me, and that's okay. I hate, and somebody better say amen, 25-minute offerings. If you ain't got it, if you ain't downloaded what the Lord's told you to give for you walk in, 25 minutes ain't going to help that. The Bible says that he that purposes in him, before you get here, you should have done had a chat with Jesus. That's how covenant works. You know, and then, then, then the people should, now listen to me, the people on the other side of the covenant should be able to come in here ready to receive instead of worrying, is pastor going to be on today or is he going to be off today because of whatever pressure he's under? See, this thing is built on faith, not even, not even the faith with Jesus because that's a given, but also faith in the household of covenant. That's why they call it the household of faith. Because you have to put yourself in intimate agreement. You cannot just have lip service and say, I go to church. You have to put yourself in full, I'm going to lay the dumb thing down. Because, listen, I, I, was, I was in a situation the other day where, where I was... I had to have a conversation with somebody about my past. And, and you know, I, I know all of you are perfect, but I, I got a past. And as some things came up, a person I used to be, the way I used to act, the drugs I used to run, the drugs I used to do, the people I used to hurt, all of that stuff came up. And they said to me these words, they said, but you say that like it was somebody else. Because it was. I, that dumb thing's dead. Listen, the whole business is dead. I took care of all of it. But how did I take it? Did it, well, did it happen in one day? No. 
But it was an everyday marriage to him. It was an everyday of getting up and hitting my face and saying, God, what do you want from me today? How do I walk in what you've called me to? Most people, most people don't want to understand what, what it means to hear God. Sadly, God's talking to them all the time. But they're just not at a place that they're hearing because they're tired. I have never seen a generation as exhausted as I've seen now. Did you know, and this shocks me, did you know that there is absolutely a new arthritis because of iPhones? That's the truth. No, that's not a joke. There is a new arthritis because of iPhones. There is a new PTSD disorder because of gaming. They, they've, they've done a study on young men uh, uh, anywhere from 8 to 14 years old that have become antisocial and violent. And it all comes back to gaming. Now, oh, well, you just say, no, 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 I don't care. That's just what the study says. They, they've got a whole new, <laughs> hey, fellas, listen, especially y'all that, that, that plan on meeting a woman one day, Texas ain't going to get it, pal. At some point, you got to talk. And if you can't learn how to talk, you single. Because unless you're planning on laying in the bed texting each other how sweet she looks. Y'all don't understand. When I was, listen, when I was a kid, of course, we, we didn't have cell phones. And my kids, my kids thought my, my mom was Ma Bell. But we had phones that were stuck in the kitchen and had a cord on it that was always tangled. But when you untangled that cord, you could drag it all the way down the hall and hide in your bedroom and talk. And then if mama, if mama decides you on the phone too long, she just walks in the kitchen. Just hangs you up. And here's the cool thing. Nobody got mad. You know why? Because their mama would do the same thing. And here's what I'm trying to tell you. We learned our relationship and trust as young children through communication. See, Elijah had to communicate with Elisha through throwing his mantle on him. But he knew because he knew his covenant. He knew his religion. He knew his God. He knew that something was being given to him that he might not understand. He might not be able to walk in yet. And it might be hard to give up a few things. It, this is not a sacrificial sermon. But this is a sermon that says you can walk in a destiny. But you got to get rid of the dumb thing. You have to get rid of the thing that holds you back. And here's the beauty of it. You can't do it yourself. You can't. Quit putting yourself down. Quit beating yourself up. Listen, I'm Pentecostal to the bone, but let me just tell you something. <laughs> Laying hands on you all day long ain't going to fix you. You can lay up here and wiggle all you want to. It's not going to happen. It's going to happen at 2 a.m. somewhere on your face when you break. And you say, God, I can't do this anymore. That's when you've given it to him. See, because this mindset that God's in control is so false. Because if God was in control, why are we losing? Uh, why are we losing children? Why are we losing people in car wrecks? Why? Why is disease rampant? If God was in control, why does the mafia have the money and the church is broke? If God is in control, why did your wife bite your head off last night? Don't say amen. <laughs> My wife's in the nursery, <laughs> and I get to edit. Um, if God was in control, why is it that we got empty seats? If God's in control, why can't we realize just how good He is? If people knew how good He is, we couldn't hold them in here. If people knew how good He was, if God was in control, don't you think He would pour out His goodness in such a way that everybody would be astounded at His amazing ability to bless you? But He's given you. Elijah gave Elisha a mantle in the Old Testament, which was a sign of what Jesus did for us. It's type and shadow, and said, follow me. And Elisha became everything Elijah was times two. Jesus said, it's imperative that I go away and you take my blood and you become saved and you accept me as your Savior because then greater things shall you do. Y'all, the church has not even gotten to the greater things because we still arguing over the color of the carpet. Thank God we got it covered <laughs> But the truth is this, we haven't gotten intimate with our Savior, really haven't. So today we're going to get to do that. Today 
Everybody give me that look like, oh, Lord, he's getting fired. No, 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 this is, this is between you and him. See, we're going to give you an opportunity to accept Jesus if you don't know Jesus. And we're going to open up prayer. If you want prayer, we'll pray for you. But what we're going to do is we're going to bring this praise team up here in just a few minutes, and we're just going to let them worship for a second. And somewhere on the inside of you, you need to take that ax, and you need to destroy that plow, and you need to kill that dumb thing, and you need to realize that God wants to help. Well, I hope you enjoyed that today. I know it's kind of a bummer us not all able to get together and see each other's faces and hug each other and smile and laugh and do the things that we do. But we are still a church. We are still a family. And we just enjoyed a great message together. I want to say this to you. Uh, it doesn't matter the message that we heard. What matters is the message that we keep. And that is the main message, that Jesus is, is Lord. He's Lord over all of this that we're going through. And if you're out there and you're watching this with someone or watching it by yourself and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, I want to give you that opportunity right now. And if you say to me, Pastor Allen, I need the Lord in my life, just pray this with me. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I know that I've messed up. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've failed. But you are coming into my heart. I accept you as my Savior. You're setting me free. Talk to me every day, God, and help me learn how to walk with you in Jesus name. Now look, if you just prayed that, you can go on this platform and click a button or send us a message and let us know that you gave your life to Jesus. That is the most important thing to us. And I just want to know that we can celebrate with you. And if we can do anything for you, we want to be here. Gathering Church family, I love you. Thank you for being here this morning. Remember, you can always send us a message. You can reach out to us through gatheringchurch.life. You can do tithing there. You can do offering. You can go there and send us your prayer requests. You can read your Bible there. Also, if you're a Becoming Center partner, you can go to the becomingcenter.life and do your financial partnership there. These guys greatly appreciate it, and they're all doing so well. It is my great honor to be able to be with them every day. We're praying for you every morning. And if you need us, we are here. April and I love you so much, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.